Hey there, welcome back. So you're ready for some more Next coding. Excellent stuff. Today we're looking at the sprite system, which can get a bit complicated. This is gonna be a little bit technical. Well, it's gonna be a lot technical to put it simply, because today we're gonna to look at what the sprite system can do, how you can get images into the Next in the first place, how you put them on the screen, and then the different ways you can manipulate the sprites as you put them on the screen. We're gonna do it all using C. I'm going to assume that you've used C before, that you've got some programming experience in it, and that you've done some with the Next already. So you know how to compile C code, get it onto a memory card, and run it on a real machine or the emulator. If you've not done that before, I've got a video up here that explains it a bit. Um, I'm going to have a GitHub repository with code inside it, and down here will be a link to my website where you can also go for a more written version of this explanation, if that helps. So enough waffling, let's get on with it. So the next has hardware sprites. This means it handles all the effort of drawing, erasing, and moving the sprites around the screen for us. We don't have to blip pixels by hand. This is pretty awesome. All we need to do is tell the next what to show and where to show it. And here's what the system is capable of. We can have 128 sprites, each sprite being 16 by 16 pixels. A display area that's 320 by 256, which is actually bigger than the layer two screen that we looked at in the other video. Sprites can be manipulated by rotating them, mirroring them and scaling them. And you can create bigger sprites by putting smaller ones together. Now we've only got 16K of what's called pattern memory. For the image data but this is separate to system RAM so it doesn't consume any of your system's memory either. So as you can see for an 8-bit machine this is quite powerful and as with most things if you've got a lot of power you've got a lot of responsibility and our main responsibility is making sure we don't confuse the next and make it draw garbage or crash so let's see what we can do. I need to give credit to Stefan Byland on GitHub for creating a sprite library that was really helpful in figuring all this out. You'll see some of his code being used in this video. The sprite system has changed slightly since his code was written, but not in any major way. If we pretend the next is made from discrete components rather than an FPGA, you can imagine the sprite system as being a separate chip that's got a small piece of memory attached to it. And that's what we're manipulating. It's completely separate to the CPU. To communicate with this chip, we do something that's quite common in the next, where there's a special register that we have to set to a specific value that like, enables or disables or configures the chip. Then we write bytes to a specific I.O. port to send the data to it. But before we do this, we need to get some sprites from somewhere. So let's look at how to do that. Now, I don't know about you, but my ability to draw sprites is about as good as my ability of keeping my house tidy. It takes a lot of effort. There's not always a lot of payback and it seems to take a long time. So to save you from having to endure my own programmer art, let's go on the internet and find some ready-made images that we can use instead. This is where I'm going to deviate from how the wiki and manual teach sprites. They provide some ready-made data that represents a sprite. You can just grab this data and use it but instead, let's look at how this data can be generated. That way, making sprites becomes a process we can repeat. I don't like systems where there's a lot of manual intervention. And if there's a big process between trying to draw a sprite and getting that into the game, it just adds a lot of extra effort. This isn't the 80s. You probably want to use an art package to draw your sprites rather than creating them by hand on graph paper. After a bit of searching, which probably took as long as drawing my own sprites, I came across this set on open game art. They're public domain and look pretty nice. They're nicer than anything I could make anyway. I was going to say it's crazy how much effort people will go to and then just give the results away. But here you are watching a free video on the internet. And if you like it, it'd be really awesome if you click the like button. Thank you. So we have some images that look lower resolution and 8-bit, but they aren't really. They're PNG, probably 16-bit color. What the next wants is an 8-bit palette-based image with a separate color palette in a file. There's some sprite tools you can use for this. 
You can use Jim Bagley's tools from this website, or you can use Stefan's from this one. I'm using Stefan's tools to do this, but they're very picky about the file type. They must be a specific kind of bitmap. So I also use an actual sprite editor to first organize my sprites into a sprite sheet. This is all pretty standard stuff if you're working with sprites. What I found is I need to export the sprites as a tall sprite sheet, not a wide one. At the end, you need a file with a sprite sheet as a raw set of bytes representing the color palette indexes and a matching palette file with the RGB values. So how do we get a sprite on the screen then? Let's begin by introducing our example sprite. This is our hero. This is Clive. As you can see, Clive is made from a number of frames that represent his various poses that he can do. This is called a sprite sheet. We're going to number them from zero going upwards. Each one represents what's called a sprite pattern. It's the image that will get shown on the screen. Sprite pattern zero represents Clive standing still. This is just what the sprite looks like though. There is a separation we need to understand between what the sprite looks like and an instance of that sprite being used by the sprite system. Before doing any of this, we need to put the sprite's pixel data into sprite pattern memory. We do this by setting the next register 303b hex to zero. What this register is and how it works will be explained soon. Then we need to read in the bytes of image data from somewhere and write them to port 58b hex, the sprite pattern upload port. We need to do that one byte at a time. The sprite patterns are stored in a special area of the FPGA that CPU doesn't have direct access to that's called the sprite pattern memory. Because this is 2021 and not the 1980s, our next is fitted with an SD card. So none of the sprite data is being embedded in the source. There's no massive block of C data here that we need to include. Instead, we'll use the ESX DOS commands to read the data off the SD card and put it into the sprite pattern memory. This is just like in C. If you read a file from disk into memory, it works the same way. To get this on the screen, we need to choose one of the hardware sprites and set its attributes. Things like its X and Y position, which pattern to use and so on. The attributes are what tell the next how to display our chosen sprite. Attributes are important and I'll get to that in a minute. These don't have an official name. The wiki just calls them sprites. So I'm going to call them sprite attribute slots. They represent the 128 actual hardware sprites that we can use. You can think of this, if you've used other engines, as like the instances of sprites, rather than the image. Don't mix up sprite patterns, which is how the thing looks, from its attributes, which is the actual hardware sprite. I keep doing that and it gets confusing to me, so don't make the same mistake. Which attribute slot we use is up to us and is part of our game's logic. Like, in the example, we're going to start with slot 0, because that's the first slot, so it kind of makes sense. But if we were making a more complex game, we'd have to choose which sprites we're using. So maybe if it was like Space Invaders, where the screen is fairly static, you might have the player sprite, three base things, and then maybe 20 sprites across the top for the Space Invaders. And that'd just be it. And everything's static and stays the same. But if you had a game where enemies moved across the screen and went away, and then other enemies came in, and you maybe had an end of level boss that was quite big, it'd be up to you to decide how you're allocating your sprites and which ones you reuse every so often. It's a bit like if you've ever seen Super Mario on the Super Nintendo, they only have a set number of sprites that they can use and they keep recycling them as things come and go on the screen. You might need to do that same technique if what you're making is quite complex. So after loading our sprite data and telling the sprites to appear on top of the layer 2 screen, we need to choose attribute slot 0. We do this with the next register 303b, which in Z88DK has a macro called IO sprite slot. This has two functions. The first is to choose which of the 128 hardware sprites we're going to be setting attributes for. I've got a function that does this. All it does is builds up the correct bit pattern to be sent to the next register. The logical AND just makes sure we only ever set the bottom seven bits. 
The most significant bit will always be zero, as the next only has 128 sprites. It's worth pointing out the documentation on this is quite confusingly written. It's not that the documentation is bad, right? That's quite important to explain. This is nice, good documentation. It's just this is a really hard topic to explain in a written form. You might need to go through it several times before it makes sense. Next register 303B is also used to tell the next which of the 64 sprite patterns to use and whether that pattern is a 4-bit or 8-bit image. Remember the distinction between defining what a sprite looks like and where on the screen it appears is different. Don't worry about 4-bit images. You can play with those later in your own time. I'm just dealing with 8-bit images. I don't think the next specifically knows you're giving it a sprite attribute index or a pattern index. There's an internal counter for both and writing to port 303b just resynchronizes them back to the same value. What is interesting and important is that selecting a sprite slot and then writing attribute data to it will cause the sprite system to increment itself to the next slot automatically. What this means is in your code, you tend to just reset it back to zero and then only reset it to zero again. You don't need to keep incrementing it yourself. So now we've selected the attribute slot. The next needs telling what to do with it by setting sprite attributes. There are up to five attribute assignments that need doing. These are written to sprite attribute upload port 57 hex. You must upload at least four attributes the fifth is optional. Attributes are how you program the sprite system. The five attributes are attribute zero is the sprite's x position's least significant bits. Attribute one is the sprite's y position least significant bits. Attribute two is a mixture of many things. If you're not that good at like manipulating bits, programming sprites in C will soon help you with that. So we need to set the palette offset, which for now you can ignore. There's then mirroring and rotating. The ninth bit for the X coordinate, because if you remember, the width of the screen for the sprites is bigger than 255, so they need an extra bit. And there's a flag to say if this sprite's palette offset is relative to something that I'm not even going to touch in this video. There's then attribute three, which is yet more bits stuck together in a bit pattern. This contains a flag to mark the sprite as being visible, a flag to enable attribute byte 4, and then 6 bits for the sprite pattern ID to use. That's the bit where you tell the sprite system what image to actually put on the screen. There is then attribute 4, which is optional and depends on whether you switched it on in attribute 3. It's a bit confusing to deal with at the moment, so we'll come to this later on. After that, the sprite appears, and it'll stay on the screen all by itself. This is all a bit theoretical, so let's see some code. Again, I have a function that does this. Here's the code to set sprite attribute zero to be sprite pattern zero, positioned at zero, zero on the screen and to be visible. So lots of zeros. This is actually quite good. If you totally screw up your initialization, something should at least appear if you set most of the values to zero. What this function does will be explained in a moment. First, let's see what it actually produces on the screen. It results in this being drawn on the screen, one 16 by 16 pixel sprite. Hello Clive. So let's look at how this works. As shown earlier, setting sprite attributes is done through the sprite upload port 57 hex. Into this port we need to send four bytes of data one after the other. So let's look at how we'd actually do that in code. The code looks weird as it seems like we're overwriting the same piece of memory but remember, this is communicating with a piece of memory mapped hardware. It's not setting a location in RAM. So you can see that first I put in the least significant bits of the X position, and then it seemed like I'm overwriting them with the Y position, but I'm not. In between that, the next has done something internally to capture that data as I've written it. The XLSB and XMSB macros just extract the most and least significant bits of a byte using Boolean arithmetic and logic. You can see them below. So to summarize, we need to set next register 303B to zero to reset the sprite system. 
Upload sprite pattern data to port 58B. Set next register 303B to 0 again to now select sprite 0. We need to write a minimum of 4 bytes to port 57. Those are the X and Y position of the sprite, flags for mirror and rotation, a flag to say whether it's visible, and then the actual pattern ID for that sprite. The flags I've just mentioned and the things we can do with the sprites I'll look at in a minute. For now, you should be able to take an image, convert it into data the next understands, and then display a sprite on the screen at a chosen location. If you can do that and it works, you've actually done the hardest bit of this whole thing. Everything from now on is adding to this, so adding multiple sprites, or making them look like they're moving, or rotating and scaling. So, keep watching, we're now going to get onto some slightly more advanced stuff. Having one sprite on the screen, very interesting, is it really? So, Clive's had a visit to the cloning factory. We've now got many of him. Let's look at how we made this happen. It's really easy. We just need to tell the sprite system to have several attribute slots and upload the bytes that we need. So let's see how this works. Remember, the current attribute slot will automatically increment itself after receiving all the attribute bytes it expects. It's important to point out that these are two different sprites that you're looking at on the screen. We've now used two sprite attribute slots from our 128 maximum. They just happen to show the same image. This is illustrating how to put more than one sprite on the screen. So first you set the attribute slot to zero to reset the sprite system. Then you upload attributes that represent the first sprite. Because you've then uploaded enough data, the next will then switch to the next sprite that it has, which will be sprite slot one. Having Clive standing still doesn't make very interesting games and even worse video content. Um, what we need is some animation. Let's make him bob up and down a bit like he's doing squats or something. In theory, this sounds really easy. It's the same code we used before for multiple sprites. We just reset the sprite attribute slot in between each sprite. So it's repeatedly setting sprite zero to be a different picture. Uh, oh, it doesn't work. Why not? We've set the sprite to be frame zero, then we've set it to be frame one. Surely we should see something happening. Why is it just still? It's not even like jiggling up and down so fast. Well, we've done it wrong. This is not how it works. Everything in the while loop you can consider happening once per frame. So we never see the first sprite appear because it immediately gets overwritten by the second one. So we need more code to make things happen on different frames. The sprite system is saving us the effort of manually blitting pixels to the screen. It's not Unity. There's no state machine behind the scenes switching images for us at a set frame rate. All the sprite system is doing is saving the CPU from having to move pixels around by itself, which if you remember from my layer two video, that's quite a slow process. Having hardware doing that for us is awesome. We though have to do the rest to create our own little sprite system. So we need logic to control when the sprites change and how fast they do it. So let's try this. Here's some code. All it does is counts frames, and then every other frame, it changes the sprite that's been drawn. So we start the loop. We first select sprite zero. If the timer we're counting is even, we set sprite zero to be pattern zero, and it appears on the screen. The next time around the loop, if the timer is odd, we pick the exact same sprite and just make it draw pattern one. And that just continues indefinitely. And if you have a look at what's going on, oh dear, poor Clive, look at this. This isn't quite right. It's doing something, but if we don't stop this, he's probably gonna have a bit of a heart attack. You know, he's getting a really good workout, but we need to slow him down a bit. So let's fiddle with the numbers for a bit, work out decent values to put in these timer loops. So I found just by experimentation, 64 and 32. But that's just this piece of code running. Because this is counting frames, it's very dependent on whether these frames arrive at the screen at the right time. So you may find that if you're doing animation, you have to tweak these values as you go along. Clive is more chilled out now. He's looking much happier. He's kind of animating at a more pleasant speed. So there we go. That's nice. 
What you've seen is a pretty brute force way of doing animation. Later on, we'll see a slightly more organized way of dealing with multiple sprites and things. But for now, you should be able to sort of play around with the sprite system. You should have a bit more of a feeling for how to change what you're seeing on the screen. So experiment with it. So at this point, you might feel confident to start going off and making your own game, which is cool. Have a go. But there are some limitations that we need to bear in mind. The first one is there's only 128 hardware sprites available. That doesn't mean you can only have 128 sprites in your entire game, but it does mean on the screen at once, there's only 128. So if you're starting to have big things moving around, or you're starting to have lots of bullets and everything, you'll run out of sprites quite quickly. So you need to be thoughtful with how this works. The screen is only about 256 by 192 in size. And that's quite small if your sprites are 16 by 16. A lot of sprites will easily fill the screen. Um, a bigger thing is that you've only got 16K of pattern memory, which with 8-bit sprites can only hold 64 sprite patterns. So if you're thinking of like a giant enemy and then little ships and things, you'll run out of memory. But there's nothing that says we have to deal with this as like a finite thing. If you may be cleverly between levels, loading different data, you can expand your game. You've got an SD card attached to the thing. So you can load images off the SD card. You could reassign the sprites in between a cutscene or something. So what you need to do is rather than treat these as limitations that are impossible to make anything with, it's part of the design of the system. It's a challenge to overcome. How can you make a bullet hell shooter when there's only 128 things on the screen? You can probably still do it, it'll be quite an interesting challenge. So if you do, have a go. Let me know what you managed to come up with. This is also why Nintendo recycled things like clouds and turned them into bushes in Mario, because they're trying to conserve what limited resources the system has. So now let's move on to looking at how to manipulate our sprites. How do we rotate them and flip them, for example? Right, let's give Clive a bit of a break. We'll be meeting him later. Instead, we're going to use some of these cars. Um, we can use these to show some effects to do with rotating and flipping images. If you look at the sprite sheet, you can see each car has only got three frames. It can go forwards, turn left, and turn right. We tried to make a game with this. The motion of the car would be a little bit limited. However, we can also use just these three sprites to also have enough patterns to make an eight-way top-down racer. The next can do the following things with its sprites, and this is all in hardware. We just tell it to do these things, and it does them for us. So what we can do is rotate the sprite 90 degrees clockwise exactly once, mirror it horizontally, mirror it vertically, and then we can also scale them larger, which we'll deal with later. How is this magic achieved? Remember those sprite attributes accessible through the IO port? Remember also how I hand waved over this bit? Well, this is where the hand waving got to. This saves some of that valuable sprite pattern memory. You can also see how we might go about storing the information for each sprite using a struct. And because this is all done in hardware, it doesn't slow down the CPU. You can see that by combining a 90 degree turn and a mirror, you can make a sprite that points the other way. Or if you've got one pointing diagonally upwards and you flip it horizontally, it's now pointing diagonally downwards. And that's all this code is showing, different combinations of that to create a turning effect that you would use. Okay, let's bring Clive back and do some more experimentation to him. 16 by 16 pixel sprites are a nice size on the next screen. They're neither too big nor too small. However, the next is capable of stretching sprites. It can stretch them widthways and heightways as well. So we'll look at how that's done. Sprites can be stretched two times, four times, and eight times the original size. This is literal just doubling and quadrupling and so on the pixels. It doesn't smooth them out. It doesn't do anything clever. To do this, we need to set some more bits in the sprite attribute IO port. Specifically, when we set sprite attribute three, to specify the sprite pattern and to make the sprite visible, we also now need to enable bit seven. 
What this does is turns on Sprite Attribute 4. If that didn't quite make sense, have a look at the code as we go through this. In Sprite Attribute 4, several things can be set that are useful to us. So bit 1 is the ninth bit for the sprite's Y position, because again, the screen is taller than 255 pixels, so you need another bit to store that extra part of the um, coordinate. Bit 2 and 3 set the scaling for the sprite's Y axis, and bits 4 and 5 set the scaling for the sprite's X axis. If you do a boolean OR with these flags, you can give every combination of scaling and stretching, which is what you're seeing at the moment. And poor old Clive is having a bit of a rough time with this. After that mistreatment, Clive's gone for a bit of a lie down. We need a new volunteer. This is Jack, and he's got a tank. I don't know why he's got a tank, he just does. But compared to Clive, he's much bigger. He's made out of four 16 pixel sprites. So if you think back to using um, the 16K pattern memory in the next, we're now using four sprites worth just for one sprite on our screen. And because he's got two frames of animation, we're actually using eight sprites worth of data. So bear that in mind. Now, let's look at how we deal with these bigger sprites. Um, we'll first get rid of Clive. We don't want him. Uh, we don't want Jack to attack him. And we're gonna see what we can do. Using what we know so far, drawing a large sprite is easy. You just treat it like, in this case, four sprites and just carefully put them on the screen, kind of like you're making a jigsaw. We want to draw Jack in his tank. Jack is made from four sprites, each one 16 by 16 pixels. Out of convention, and to help understand the later part we're getting to, we'll take the top left sprite and call it the anchor sprite. That's the one that we'll consider is like the main part of the sprite, like its handle, if we're moving it around the screen. Doing this is all right, but it means our program has to keep track of four separate sprites, where they are, and if the sprite moves, we've then got to add numbers to all their coordinates to keep things in the same shape. The next can do this for us. So first we need some definitions because the next wiki doesn't really explain this very clearly. It is quite difficult when we get into it. There is an anchor sprite. That's what you can consider as the main sprite. There's things called relative sprites, and they're drawn relative to the anchor sprite. And they can be one of two types. There are composite sprites and unified sprites. When the next draws sprites, it looks at each sprite in turn as they're being drawn to see what kind it is. Unless you tell it otherwise, the sprites are all a type of sprite known as an anchor sprite. Being an anchor sprite just means the next remembers certain attributes about it after drawing that sprite on the screen. So it remembers things like its position, its rotation, and whether it was mirrored. If it then encounters a relative sprite, some of those remembered attributes are applied or used to modify that relative sprite's own attributes. Relative sprites are all based off the last anchor sprite drawn. So I've just been talking about relative sprites. So what are composite and unified sprites? Well, they're types of relative sprite because you can now decide how your relative sprites cooperate with each other and with their anchor sprite. You know in space games where the player's ship has some sort of helper craft going round it? That helper craft could be considered a composite sprite if you're doing it on the next. Its position is relative to an anchor sprite, which would be the player. The player moves their own ship. The spinning thing around the ship moves by itself, but always kind of based on where the player's ship is. It's a bit like the moon going around the earth as the earth goes around the sun. So that's a composite sprite. It's a collection of sprites that all move and act relative to their anchor. So you can rotate, mirror and scale them separately. A unified sprite is more like Jack. Jack is too big to fit in a 16 by 16 pixel sprite. So we do the natural thing of gluing together more sprites to represent him. That's what a unified sprite is, that's it. It inherits all the attributes of its anchor, including rotation, mirror, and scaling. This was quite common on 8 and 16-bit machines, where you had some sort of big enemy boss. And yeah, I know the ST didn't have sprites, but I was playing it on an emulator, and I've got an ST. Videos above. But if this was the Amiga version, that guy would be made from smaller sprite pieces joined together. Doing this in code is quite simple, though. We already know how to make an anchor sprite. They're just regular sprites. So you set the X and Y position, and you set the sprite flags. But now, when we set attribute 3, we can then tell the next whether the relative sprites it encounters soon 
are unified or not. So if we don't want them unified, we just set the pattern ID and whether the sprite is visible or not. That's it. If we want it to be unified, we then need to give it more data. So we first need to turn on attribute four and in attribute four, we need to set a flag that says any relative sprites you find next are going to be unified. So there was quite a lot of different concepts in there about how it draws sprites and everything. So to summarize, sprites can only be 16 by 16 pixels. So if you want bigger sprites, you've got to glue together multiple sprites on the screen. You can have anchor sprites. They're the normal ones. You've just been using them already. Then there is also this concept of relative sprites. That's a sprite that is relative to the last anchor sprite that was drawn. And there are two types. There are composite sprites. They're ones a bit like the moon going around the earth. There's then unified sprites. This is literally the end of level boss where he's too big to be in one sprite, so you've cut him up into smaller pieces. So, having thoroughly confused you by now about the sprite system, those of you that are still with us have probably figured something out. Something that always seems to happen in these kind of how to do a thing videos, especially to do a game dev. I've shown you how to make a single sprite appear on the screen, or shown you some copy pasted code that makes multiple sprites appear. It's not very scalable though, is it? Like earlier I mentioned if you had space invaders or something, with a whole grid of them moving about and a player at the bottom. Well, how do we deal with that? Let's look at some basic um, techniques that we can use for coping with multiple sprites. So this is not a piece of code that you could just copy paste and off you go but it should show several ideas and concepts that are really useful when trying to manipulate bulk numbers of sprites. Try and resist the urge to go crazy with this. Again, this is not a PC running Unity. It's a little 8-bit computer with 128 sprites in one go. So that's the first thing to understand. There's only 128 of them. There's not much data to actually keep track of. So we can make a structure. And in this structure, I'm just showing some basic things about what it means to be a sprite. So it's position on screen, um, the flags that appear for it, it's pattern ID, and then I've got a velocity so I can move it around a bit. So let's work with this and see how we can use it. Then we can have an array of these, all 128 of them. I'm having 10 at the moment just to make it easier to code. At the start of our program, we can define what each sprite is going to be and importantly, set them all to be invisible. So I've just got a loop that goes through all 10 sprites and does a little bit of basic maths. It's just setting a random x and y velocity and then it's just putting the sprite on the screen at a random position and making sure that all the sprites are switched off so you don't see them immediately. Now we can have a main loop that goes through that array and if the sprite is visible we upload its data into the sprite attribute slots. So there's a distinction here between sprites I've defined for my game and sprites that are actually on the screen being managed by the system. So first we set the attribute slot to zero to reset the sprite system's um, addresses. Then there's a loop. And all I'm doing is copying the data into the sprite system. That's it. What we've done is separate managing and drawing sprites from the game logic. In this case, it just makes the sprites bounce randomly around the screen. The code is a bit weird looking because we're checking if integer positions go bigger than 255, which isn't possible. And don't worry about the specifics of this piece of code. A future video I'll make is about how to make things move around the screen. So if you're liking what you're hearing and seeing so far, maybe give the video a like. That'd be really nice. And if you want to keep updated with further videos I make about this, hit the subscribe button if you think it's worth doing. But what you should see now from this little section is that by using a few basic data structures, thinking about how you separate bits of functionality from each other, you can create something that's quite complex without it getting away from you with lots of copy and pasted code that you can't actually change. So this is where you can now take all this stuff and make your own sprite system. It may depend on what game you're making as to how complex it needs to be. And there we go, that's sprites on a spectrum next. Um, if you made it this far, well done. Maybe consider giving the video a like, it really helps. If it didn't make sense, please tell me, but also go watch it through again. There's also the proper wiki 
go read that. That's got it explained in a lot of detail with what all the flags and everything do for some of the more confusing bits. It's not too bad once you've got your head around how it all fits together. That I found was the most confusing part. What a relative sprite was, what sprite patterns were, why there's 128 of one thing and only 64 of another thing. Once all that kind of fits together, it kind of makes more sense. Um, in the next video, we're going to kind of slow down a bit. This one's been quite full on. We're just going to look at how to use a joystick and a mouse and a keyboard to control these sprites that we've now created. Maybe just create something where a sprite can move around the screen in a nice, simple way. So I'm off for a cup of tea now and to regain what limited sanity I had to begin with. And until next time, I'll see you later.